innovation is uh, bringing out a new product or service that uh, drastically changes the way something's done and does it better. And uh, it's really the, the performance of something, how something works, that is true innovation. If you can use less electricity, if you can change the way it's done, use less materials, uh, do it quicker, faster, whatever it is, that's true innovation, a technical improvement. I think it's, it's very important that we do improve everything all the time. Uh, it enhances our lives, makes our lives more enjoyable, better, allows us to do more, to have a greater scope to our lives. So that's important. As far as a company is concerned, it's terribly important they innovate. Now there's a global marketplace and anyone can make anything. There's enormous competition, which is good, but the people who are going to survive are not necessarily the people who can make the thing the cheapest, but the people who can make something that works the best. Well, the thing I noticed, because as an inventor, I'd been round all the people actually are now my competitors to offer them my invention. And one by one, they turned it down. And uh, I suppose I should have been very depressed about this, but actually I got quite excited towards the end because I realized that these big multinational companies weren't very interested in inventing something and improving things. They weren't really interested in innovation, uh, which I think is what happens to big companies because drastic changes to their product is a big risk, involves a big risk. So they're very reluctant to do it, even if they were interested in technical innovation in the first place, which most of them aren't. So I slightly disagree. I think that um, small companies or people with start-up businesses have a huge advantage. Uh, they're much more capable of being radical. And um, the public likes the small man, the man who takes on the big boys, the David and Goliath. They like someone who um, is fairly fearless in the way they innovate and change the product, products as we know them. Well, Thomas Edison was the first inventor to understand the process of development of technology by iteration. And his principle is that you build prototype after prototype after prototype to try and make your invention work. But what, what's very significant is that he only makes one change to the prototype every time he builds a new prototype. And because he's only making one change, he knows exactly why it worked or didn't work. So it's a process of discovery. So though it sounds very boring to build thousands and thousands of prototypes, it's actually fascinating because you are understanding what that change, that single change does. It improves it, you get excited. If it doesn't improve it, if it's a failure, you actually get excited as well because you've understood why it didn't work. So as you go through this process, you build up this wonderful bank of knowledge about what does work and doesn't work. And you end up often with something completely different to the first prototype you started with. And it looks as though you've made an incredible invention. And actually all you've done is made lots of little changes all the way through your adventure until what you come up with is radically different. Um, well, I was an awkward child, I think, and, and uh, difficult with teachers at school. But uh, I followed the arts, I did classics at school and um, went to an art school to learn about design because I, you know, I was interested in art at school and I was quite interested in the practical application of art. So design seemed to be a natural thing to go to. But when I was at design school, I suddenly realized that the interesting things about products wasn't particularly how they looked, although that is important, it's how they work, it's the technology used in them and the engineering that's important. Uh, and, and then I realized that technology or new technology is about inventing things. So I, I'm a mature inventor in that sense. I didn't discover my interest in it till halfway through my, my life at college. But um, I think the, some people come to inventing by being a scientist and that's brilliant. I'm the other sort, that an, I'm an artist uh, but I understand the value of invention and I'm willing to, to try something very different, to do the wrong thing, wrong thinking. A scientist might have difficulty doing wrong thinking, so scientists will tend to think the right way of doing something. 
the advantage I have is that all my thinking is wrong thinking. Um, so I start from a, a different point. And starting from a different point is interesting because the first thing you do is have a failure, a terrific failure, because it's the wrong thing. But in that learning process, why is, why is that failed? I start on a different track. My track's a very different track to his track. Now, sometimes it'll be a complete failure and I'll fail, but sometimes it sets me on a track which actually succeeds and is very unexpected and not capable of being deduced by one skilled in the art, which is the, which is the maxim of a patent. So um, by not understanding the correct scientific way of doing something, I'm having a different approach. And I'm very lucky now because I've got very capable scientists, so I'm able to challenge their way of doing things and persuade them sometimes to try a, a completely stupid or wrong way of doing something to see what happens. Yes, I mean, other people are important. And at the beginning, I had about four engineers and myself. And engineers are very good people to have around you. And they're actually surprisingly good at things other than engineering. I think it's their training teaches them to be very deductive. Uh, so when it came to selling our vacuum cleaner and manufacturing our vacuum cleaner, it was engineers doing it, not professional manufacturers and professional salesmen. Um, and that was fine for a while. Uh, and then there became a point where I had to hire specialist salesmen, had to hire specialist buyers and production men. In any case, the engineers wanted to get back to engineering. Mm -hmm. um, but I am a believer in naivety. And I think a lot of scientists, engineers, or inventors think they need businessmen to start a business, or professional salesmen, or professional this and that. You don't. I think if you're intelligent, you keep thinking and keep innovating. I mean, not just about um, the product, but about ways of doing business, ways of selling and ways of treating your customers. Mm -hmm. So I think if you think intelligently and approach it in a naive way, uh, you could be very effective. I mean, what is a businessman? I mean, he's, you know, he usually comes from one of the professions, so why can't he be an engineer? Why can't he be the person who thought of the product, who had the marketing sense to see the need for a product, so he's already a marketeer. Mm -hmm. um, he's probably a good salesman because he's very passionate about his product. Mm -hmm. If he's made his prototype, he understands manufacturing. So the inventor, the engineer, the creator of the idea has a pretty good spectrum knowledge of, 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 of what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would encourage inventors to go into manufacturing, to go into selling, uh, because they'll do a very good job of it. Well, I, my wife uh, fortunately didn't question that decision, but um, you know, the thing is that, that um, you know, my life and my passion is about products, developing new technology for products, and then going off and making them and selling them. That's what I want to do. Uh, I'd done the sea truck uh, and uh, enjoyed it enormously. It was, it was a great success. But I wanted to do something on my own. You know, I'd done that with another great inventor, a much better inventor than me, who had made a great success with the business. And he invented the sea truck and I came along and engineered and designed it and learnt all my mistakes, if you like, with them. Um, and I wanted to do something on my own. It was, it was my own invention and do it on my own. So tell me about the first invention, the ball barrel. Well, the, the ball barrow, I mean, I've been using a wheelbarrow at home, We're building my first house, not exactly building, but doing it up. And um, I used a conventional wheelbarrow and just got thoroughly irritated with it. You know, the narrow wheel sank into the soft ground and the metal bin rusted and cement stuck to it. Just about everything about it irritated me. Um, so as I was doing all this hard work, I started thinking up solutions to solve all the problems. And um, previously with a sea truck, I'd been selling to the military and big oil companies, construction mm -hmm. companies. But I wanted to sell to real people, something they could use at home. And my dissatisfaction with a wheelbarrow led me to want to do a wheelbarrow. I used a vacuum cleaner as a small boy and uh, remember this screaming noise, the smell of stale dog and stale <laughs> dust and having to bend down and pick things up. 
and now I'm 28 and I've got my own family and house and uh, I buy what is the most powerful vacuum cleaner in the world and I go home and I smell stale dog, a I get a screaming noise and I'm bending down to pick things up but it's not picking up. So I, I you know, got quite angry one Saturday and decided to take the machine to bits to try to understand it and to see what the problem was. And what I realised was that I'd been pretty stupid. I thought the dust just got deposited in the bag and the suction was dependent on the strength of the motor. What I realised that Saturday was that all the dust went into the bag and the air with it. So the air had to go through the bag. But the bag pores, which the air is supposed to go through, get clogged very quickly with the first dust that goes into the bag. So that stops the airflow. And the stopping of the airflow stops the suction on the floor. So it doesn't matter how strong your motor is, the bag blocks the airflow and so blocks the ability for it to pick up. So, and I thought, well, this is pretty terrible. You know, this is a product that loses massive amount of its performance really quite quickly. You know, it's 50% of its suction after 10, 20 minutes. Um, and there's no other product like that. A light bulb gives you 100 watts until it goes pop and your car goes 70 miles an hour down the road until there's a major catastrophe. I couldn't think of any product which performs so badly. So um, the thought was nagging in my mind, and then I went to a um, lumber yard and saw a cyclone on the roof, this huge 30-foot high cyclone with lots of ducting collecting dust off the, off the saws and planers. And I realized that this thing was not clogging. It was, wasn't blocking the airflow. It was spinning the dust out of the airstream, and the clean air was going out of a chimney out of the top. So I wondered why that system wasn't used for the collection of dust inside vacuum cleaners. So I rushed home and built a very crude prototype, which appeared to work. And I got excited and decided to devote my life to vacuum cleaners. <laughs>I think they were very suspicious of inventors by this point. They, they, um, no, I think they made the comment that if there was a better vacuum cleaner, Hoover or Electrolux would have done it. You know, who are you to think you could make a better vacuum cleaner? And they had a point, but I was convinced I had a good idea. And so we parted company and I went off on my own to develop my cyclones. Yes, it forced me to do it on my own. Uh, it forced me to start again. And I got my first... Uh, taste of failure, rejection, so, which probably helped because I knew I'd have to fight to make this one work. And so when I ultimately approached companies to try and get them to buy my technology and they rejected me, uh, I, you know, I, I was used to failure by that point, used to rejection. <laughs> I was borrowing money from the bank to keep me going and uh, I thought that it would take me about six months to develop the cyclone. Um, and I, I did set myself quite a high target. I wanted to have um, no loss of suction at all, so it had to be perfect in that respect. But it also had to collect very fine dust, very, very fine dust. I'm talking cigarette smoke type dust. So it, two, two very tough um, elements of the specification. So I started off and um, the months went by and the years went by and I was building several prototypes a day and testing them. Uh, and it actually took over four years, between four and five years, for me to get it right. The main difficulty, apart from the fact that I had to collect this very fine dust uh, down to half a micron, it's the stuff that sort of floats around in the air. Previously, the state of art on cyclones is that they're good at 20 microns. I had to get it down to half a micron. So that was a big technical challenge. And the second challenge was that whereas a sawmill collects fine sawdust all day long, uh, whereas a lumber yard collects fine sawdust all day long, uh, a vacuum cleaner is not only collecting this very fine dust, it's also collecting, well, socks and <laughs> handkerchiefs and long strands of hair and carpet fluff, lots of very different, difficult objects. So the normal shaped cyclone, which is a sort of tapered thing, doesn't work for those difficult objects. So I had to find another way of collecting those. 